Hello everyone and welcome back to Realism Overhaul with RP1 in Kerbal Space Program 1.3.1 and in this episode I begin feeling a little bit cheated because here we have the Titan 1 upper stage tank that I've been using for my Titania rocket so far and uh, it's got 27.25 tons wet and 25.6 kiloliters of volume and gives us a burn time of 3 minutes and 38 seconds with the LR-105. So that's the one we've been using. And, but the LR-105, when upgraded, you see, has a rated burn time of 5 minutes and 50 seconds. Uh, this is the NA-5 variant. And I figured I could use a bigger tank on this stage, right, to take advantage of its burn time. Uh, so I purchased the Titan 2 slash 3 slash 4 upper stage fuel tank, which is also good because it also gives control of vessels up to a thousand tons so we can drop the probe core down below and so I decided to put that on here but then I noticed this max volume is the same as this other tank so because it's heavier our delta V actually goes down with that other tank the old tank we have 3821 this visibly larger tank gives us the same burn time and less delta V well, that sucks. Um, so I guess no luck on that one. Uh, but we have other Titan II tanks. Let me see what they're... So this co the cost is 367 It's a little bit cheaper than the Titan I tank. So there's that. Which is odd because it has a better probe core. But uh, it's heavier too. Which... Uh, okay. Um, this Titan II tank has less, less capacity than this Titan I tank. This only has 22 kiloliters. Seems like the Titan 1 tank is the best tank for the upper stage. The G GLV upper stage tank is only 22.8. That's a totally different thing. Yeah, as far as the prefab Titan tanks goes, this is actually the best one. It's fairly light. But the problem is, of course, um, it doesn't take advantage of this engine. So I'm going to have to see what I can do about that. And I'll come back to you with the solution. But I don't know if we're going to get enough Delta V out of this to do a lunar sample return. That's what I'm really working on here. We unlocked a bipropellant RCS. And so I've got Aerozine and N2O going on here. So the RCS is tuned to that. I spent a bit of money uh, making sure that they had that configuration. I tried putting uh, two kilonewton thrusters instead of the AJ-10. That didn't work out so well. Uh, mainly because right now we're at low tech level on the Aerozine. And also, uh, if you take a look, the AJ-10 mid is 0.09 tons. This 2 kN thruster is 0.03. So if you have three of them, that's about the same mass of the AJ-10. But three of these only has 6 kN or so, which is one-fifth the thrust of the AJ-10. So not so good to use those, actually for this. Uh, we do need some thrust, though I mean, yeah, it's just a matter of thrust weight ratio. They're a little bit heavier. Um, I wish I could tool a balloon tank here, but of course you can't have high pressure balloon tanks apparently. Um, <laughs> not surprised, but uh, yeah, working on this and seeing if I can eke out the Delta V. So I'll come back to you. Okay, well, my solution was to skip the Titan tanks entirely and go with balloon tanks because I had previously tooled a balloon tank of 2 meters for our RD-58 stage. And so I've got a series of, uh, I think, four of those on here, uh, 2 meter tanks. And then I strapped, because we had tooled 0.48 meter tanks in the Tank 2 configuration, I've strapped a whole bunch of those on the side. It's a, it's a horrible situation, but this is what tooling gets you. Uh, so that gets us to about the burn time of the LR-105. So, uh, yep, uh, just strap those on, on top of the balloon tanks, which uh, we'll call them stringers. They're, they're structurally beneficial elements to this whole thing, I assure you. Uh, so, yeah, and of course the LR-105 feeds from a balloon tank anyway on Atlas, so that fits. Now, after dealing with that stage, I discovered that uh, there is another quirk. Uh, I unlocked the Titan III tank, and uh, the, the first stage tank now. And uh, sure enough, the mass fraction of the Titan I tank is better than 
of the Titan 3 tank. The Titan 3 tank, tank is longer and therefore cheaper uh, because we have to stack two of these in order to uh, get the Delta V we need. But the mass fraction of uh, this empty, the dry mass, is 4.1%, whereas for the Titan 3 tank it's 44 So I guess they strengthen the Titan 3 tank, but in the context of Kerbal Space Program that doesn't help us very much. So I'm going to stick to the Titan 1 tank here again. And so I'm going to continue building this up. And uh, I still don't know if we have enough Delta V for the sample return mission, but we might as well try it anyway. I'll also queue up uh, another version of the Sierra Nevada because that was uh, cruelly denied to us by test flight last time. And we'll see if we can send that out properly this time. That'll probably be first. Okay, here we are with the Sierra Nevada launch, once again, lined up with the moon. And I guess we should just keep that out, in fact, to make sure that we stay lined up with the moon. And we'll see if it works. Thrall is up, SAS is on, ignition. And launch. Again, it looks like an Agena upper stage, but it isn't. It's the RD-58, and that gave us problems last time. Still, it's too good an engine to pass up on. And now we're up to 6,000 data units. 79 minutes speed time before failure. That's not very good. That's not very good. I mean... Oddly, it's better than the LR-89s, but I swear the LR-89s have had fewer problems. They've had problems. I mean, they've had shutdowns and spin-outs. Of course, when one of the booster engines on Atlas shuts down, it will spin. And that's basically the end of the mission. We've had that, but still, I think the RD-58s had more. Okay, booster engine set. Uh, try that again. All right. Okay, we've had a good burn there. Okay, we've had a good burn there. And separation. And the RD-58 is a go. But it has to relight at least one more time for a flyby, but ideally twice to also get us into orbit around the moon. We have enough Delta V. That's not a problem. But, boil off. I didn't really... Uh, add any insulation to this tank, and again, I don't know if this Agena-D propellant tank can take insulation, so... We'll have to see about boil-off. It's possible that I should just add an auxiliary auxiliary propel, uh, propulsion system to this. Maybe on the nose, in fact. Maybe in a nose fairing here, we could add a retro-burn package for the moon. Okay, really circular orbit, uncharacteristic of me, 199 by 197. Yeah, that's as low an eccentricity as I usually I would ever get. So anyway, uh, let's plot for the moon, 5,363 meters per second. So it depends on what the rate of boil off is. I suppose the idea should be to get to the moon as quickly as possible. Okay, I'm using a little bit of extra Delta V to get there in two days and 18 hours, which is a little bit fast. That uh, means that capturing into orbit is a little bit more onerous. However, uh, we don't have to capture into a tight orbit. So even something like this will do, but still that's 450. If I was approaching a little bit slower, it could be as little as 200 something. So we'll see. It's a trade-off between dealing with boil off or uh, having a nice slow approach, uh, uh, very little excess velocity once we get there. We really should have switched the hydrazine to aerozine and N204, and maybe just the RCS system, though I would like some one kilonewton thrusters, but maybe just that would have been able to get us into orbit. Um, it'd be better just to limit the RD-58 to doing the transfer burn and just add more aerozine and N204 to fulfill the orbital requirements. I mean, have we done photography here? Oh, that it has to be 
return? Oh no, I hope that's not true from the moon as well. Oh, speaking of oh no, do I have enough comms on here? Hmm, we may have other problems. Anyway, go. Oh no, the engine failed. Well, all right. All right, RCS, uh, we need you to uh, bring this back down. Once again, this failed, but I seem to have other problems with it. We could do better, but more, more experience with the RD-58. Uh, we are now at 7,000 data units, but yeah, that's a frustrating little engine. Efficient, but frustrating. Well, we expended all of the hydrazine, but it looks like it didn't get us decisively into the atmosphere. I mean, it is in the atmosphere. We'll still call this disposed of for now, but I'm not going to follow it down. All right, I guess we'll try to sample return mission. We, we'll work on this business and see what we can do about it. Uh, so frustrating. Okay, our sample return mission or attempted sample return mission is rolling out. and But while I was time warping, curb alarm clock decided to allow me to time warp right past this uh, maneuver node. Darn it. Uh, that was not nice. But this is a maneuver for our Venus 1 probe. Um, I think I'll take that, right? That's close. Oh, whoa, whoa. Oh, shoot. It's doing things. Um, execute the sun up maneuver. Okay, here we are with our sample return mission attempt, and it is unfortunately still night. I did pick up a uh, lunar landing contract again, and uh, I don't think I got, yeah, I didn't get the lunar sample return contract just yet until we know we can do it. But the lunar landing contract will pay for this, and at least we have enough Delta V for lunar landing, even if. Uh, you know, the Delta V for sample return doesn't work out. So, uh, throttle up, SAS is on, and ignition. Incidentally, the side pods are not boosters, they do not separate. They are fixed. Oh, gosh, insufficient avionics. Huh. Right, because the upper stage no longer has the avionics core that used to be in the Titan 1 tank. I forgot about that. Well, um, just pretend that I've got the other core on. It'll be fine. <laughs> uh, I just needed to add another 0.2 ton core to the inner stage here. It's a little bit cheaty, but... We'll use MechJet to circumvent this minor inconvenience temporarily. This has quite a lot of lag for some reason. Maybe it's the tanks, maybe it's the engine. I mean, we've got only six engines at the bottom. It's a lot, very laggy. I'm not sure why. Oh, we lost one engine. Uh, with six engines, that's not too big a deal. The problem is, it's one of the engines on the core. And so, actually, it doesn't matter, because once again, we're not separating off the boosters. It's fine. It's okay. Ooh, but here we are in uh, approaching max Q, past the speed of sound here. So, this is the touchiest bit, considering the fact that we've lost an engine. Though we're not using much pitch roll or yaw authority at all. For that, we'd be using more if one of the outer engines went off. First failure of an H1 engine, though. Okay, now we have full avionics. Used to be that KOS could also circumvent, uh, circumvent the, uh, the avionics limits, but I'm not entirely sure that's still the case. I've queued up another Sierra Nevada, but this one is much improved and is now dubbed Sierra Nevada 2. So we will try that again as well. Currently, we do not have lunar rated heat shields, so the recovery capsule on this is just a regular heat shield. Same with, uh, I've added a recovery capsule to the Sierra Nevada as well, since it seemed like we might want to return to photography. We'll see how that works out, that's a big question mark. But lunar rated heat shields are currently being unlocked, that's the technology we are working on, it's just gonna take 24 more days. And then after that, prototype hydrolox engines then 
1962 orbital rocketry, interplanetary probes, basic power generation, 1964 stage combustion. Um, I might put early hydrolox before a second generation capsules. I'm not in a pressing need for the Gemini capsule, to be honest. We'll probably want that for the moon, unless I decide to just send one Kerbal. It's possible I'll just send one Kerbal. It's a curious thing. Um, the little probe cores are not as useful as the upper stage cores these days. The upper stage cores um, power down. And considering how light they are, they pretty much make the probe cores redundant. The only time I use the probe core, you know, like the early controllable core or something like that, is for a little recovery capsule. Otherwise, it's better to use the upper stage avionics for practically everything. Okay, I was sort of hoping that the second stage would actually be able to make us, get us into orbit. We'll see. Okay, set. Okay, LR-105 has lit. Okay, fairing set. Now let me check that those are the right fairings. Yep. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have just enough to make orbit on this stage. Good times. Well, now the Delta V doesn't look quite as good. Thanks to the fact that I've had to hold my pitch up a bit. Kind of flatten out in an attempt to make sure we do get into orbit on this stage. I didn't leave much RCS on the next stage. We do have five ignitions, but you know how the that engine goes. So I did put a controller on here. I guess it just wasn't enough. This has been a long, long burn, and I'm pretty sure the tanks, all these little tanks, somehow cause extra lag. Incidentally, uh, I did add tweak scale in order to resize nose cones, um, and that's because the procedural nose cones don't have this conformal thing. I need to have some way of recoloring those so they, they match things better instead of being gray. Okay, perhaps we have just enough. It's really close. Basically, if you sum up that number and our orbital velocity, it comes out to be 7,800, which is orbital velocity. So, it's really close. Well, I'm just gonna let it burn out, I think. Okay, 285 by 207. Uh, set. RCS. Forward. I mean, we've got 3,113 here, and that's 3,113. That seems pretty good. Three days and seven hours. Might as well take that. It's a rough match for the Delta V we have. Rough because we're probably going to get some Delta V out of selling the fuel down with the RCS. But also because of boil off. We're waiting an hour and 21 minutes here. Okay, it looks like we're quite a bit off thanks to the boil off. We'll see what the tiny bit of RCS can manage. I think we'll end up with 20 meters per second from that at most. So, separation. And. Oh, wait, I, I, I need some of these RCS thrusters active, please. Really, it should be able to use um, gimbling to control this, but apparently it's not. And where is it going exactly? Sort of a crash course, but that's actually what we want, more or less. I'll, I'll take that. We're spin stabilized for some reason. Let's see if we can get power like this. Let's see if activating these will help. They aren't even firing. Oh, no, those aren't the top set. Those were the complementary part of this. I see, okay. I only fired one half of the thrusters over here, that's why. 
Well, that looks like it'll be better able to communicate, right? Uh, maybe a little bit more. Good thing this has infinite ignitions and everything. Okay, um, things have flipped around, so... Alright, we will take that and hope for the best. Uh, I don't care whether you're stable or not right now. Landing guidance, show landing predictions. So how long do we need? Two minutes to burn this stage, and then we'll probably use the next stage to make the final touchdown. I'm probably not going to use the landing gear on here, which, you know, suggests maybe I should just dump the landing gear. But we'll go with this for now. It's too tall anyway. We should just land on this stage. I can't shut down the... Oh, wait. Okay, now it's... What is it doing? Well, I know about signal delay, but that doesn't explain that... Something is... Okay. No... Yeah, something's interfering with me. What's interfering with me? What's doing this? So basically my throttle is up and something's trying to throttle down. Now I can't throttle up at all. But that might be because it's unstable and everything, but... I don't I don't know what I was trying to do. Uh maybe if I stabilize it. Okay, maybe it was just the instability. I don't think I can arrest the whole vertical speed thing. <laughs> uh well yeah, we've already smashed. So uh, yeah, I think it was just a matter of selling the fuel down, but that wasn't Normally what happens is when I throttle up and the fuel isn't settled, MechJeb will use the RCS thrusters, but it couldn't use the RCS thrusters because there are no bottom-facing RCS thrusters. So I was supposed to wiggle around in order to settle the fuel down, and I didn't. Anyway, there was a lot of problems with this as it is. Uh, we'll have to work on it. Delta V-wise, that's promising. The little uh, return capsule has about 500 meters per second on its own. So that's not quite enough to return all the way back to Earth, but it's close. Okay, here we are with the Sierra Nevada 2, and can I get a successful moon mission finally? It's definitely been an off day for me, and I'm not feeling great about it. But uh, here we go, throttle up, SAS is on, and ignition. And launch. I mean, the last mission was more a matter of working out the kinks of a particular system. But I felt that it was a bit dirty on my part. Okay, booster engine set. Alright. All good so far. Okay, stage set. And the uh, RD-58 has ignited. So, I guess at this point we should talk about some of the improvements. First of all, you'll note one kilonewton thrusters there and fully fueled Aerozine and 204 for our capture. And then up top we have the return capsule with more than enough fuel. And the first use of fuel lines because I wanted to be able to use the fuel up here for capturing around the moon just in case these two at the bottom weren't enough. And if we can transfer the science to a probe core, which uh, we've done on the Twitch series, but I haven't done here before. Then we can uh, get the science from these uh, sample capsules up into the probe core up here for a return. So that'll be good too. But we'll see. Uh, at this point, we're in space. I might as well extend the antennae before I forget. It seems we actually have a little less Delta V than I expected. Um, as far as this stage is concerned. It's not got enough to get us to the moon, according to this. Too much of a load at the top. Overdid that. Okay, yeah, coming up about 300 short on this stage. 
but I did put a few lines in here and hopefully that'll work. I also made sure that crossfeed was enabled on that. But I was afraid that without the few lines the decoupler would get in the way. We will see. Okay, but first plotting for the moon. Oh, it looks like I've got the wrong RCS thrusters active. Uh, yeah, these are supposed to be active and why don't we get those one kilonewton thrusters on as well. That'll make it a little bit easier later on. Okay, we've got a good ignition. It looks like they're draining from these tanks first, that's good. Might as well get this started. So let's see, I'm, I'm sure we've done all the science around here. Uh, you know, let's keep that experiment and that. And let me see, can this probe core take data? Yeah, it says collect all. Okay, yes, it can collect data from the other experiments, so that's critical. That will help. We can open camera doors, that's fine. Sort of pointed the wrong way right now. But it's just ocean anyway. We'll pretend to be a space telescope. Okay, well, the main stage has depleted and we're on the one kilonewton thrusters now, which is fine. That should make it easier to approach the moon. But are we going to have enough to make orbit and return? That's a different question. I think I'll just keep it to there to help with communication. All right, I'm not too sure what altitude would be best for the radar, radar altimetry sensor, so we will see. Okay, we're not recharging right now. That's not right. No, it's not very inclined at all, actually. Just 39 degrees, it says. In retrospect, it would have been better just to stage off the Agena stage and the RD-58, I think. But originally, this was built around a different premise. And it does look good as a unit. We can do science here. Oh, apparently the film camera doesn't work here? Well, heck, we brought it all the way to the moon and we can't take pictures? What about preventing space alien madness? Gosh darn it. it looks like we can't do that here. We could do the goo, though. That's high over the moon. We can do low over the moon as well. But we're now depleting this fuel up here. I guess it, once you've transferred the data to it, then it doesn't like to take any more data? I don't understand. Or maybe it can't take the goo data? Well, we're in sort of a crappy orbit here. Uh, oh, well, wait, maybe we're not. Let's finish the crappy orbit. All right. But I want to dump off the Agena and the useless, as it turns out, camera. And try and bring the capsule back, at least. We didn't get much science out of it, but we'll take what we can get. Okay, well, that is an orbit. And it'll do the radar scan, right? A little bit, maybe? It's a pretty high orbit for it. Too high right now. Hmm. I... Yeah. I'll just figure out what to do about that some other time. I want to test the whole recovery thing. So... Yep. Let's make sure these are activated. And we're separating that off. Okay. And unfortunately, our apoapsis is in the wrong place. Hmm. Uh, this might not go particularly well. We've got 500 here and then a little bit more in the probe core at the top. Well, we'll see. Okay, we'll go with this maneuver in two days. 
Well, good thing we don't have anything pressing. We're still waiting for lunar rated heat shields here, and that's in three days and 22 hours. Then maybe we can build a crewed mission to fly by the moon. With our recent moon luck, that might be overly ambitious. So basically, this is a test to see whether a non-lunar rated heat shield will still work for a lunar re-entry so long as the heat shield loading is low enough. How the heck is it calculating this thrust to weight ratio anyway? Guess we're so high up over the moon that the moon's gravity doesn't have much effect. Alright, we are on our way out. Now, at Apoapsis here, if we pull our orbit down, how much is it going to cost? 477. Again, we do have fuel in this bit here, but its thrusters aren't pointed, you know, well for a retro burn. They're more for controlling the probe, but we'll see. We'll see how much we have. Darn it, something will go right. I think we're going to have to go around Earth entirely before doing this retro burn. We do have lunar raid heat shields now. So this pole test is pointless. But anyway, retro burn. Okay, and then this next stage will have to turn prograde basically. Whoa, that was serious force. That's good. Well, let's see if it's enough. Oh, it's going to take a while. Okay, really, really close. That's pretty severe. That'll certainly be quite a test if we do it like that. Hmm. Do I really want to turn around and boost up again? Uh, maybe if I do it gently and not let the other systems do it. This is a nice time for persistent rotation. The fact that I started a very, very slow rotation and can let it perpetuate. Not enough solar panel apparently. I thought it was for this probe core. But maybe not for the antennae. Oh, a maneuver node for Venus 1. Well, shoot. Um, how far are we from this? Uh, pretty far. Okay, well, I'm going to add an alarm here. Add that to this. All right, let's pay attention to Venus 1, the other Venus 1. Okay, well, that was the plan anyway. Maybe let's do that so that when we finally go to sun up, maybe as we're rotating, we'll end up there. Okay, we've got it. It's all done. And our new approach to Venus is like that. Well, you know, we'll fix that once we get there and we'll certainly be getting low science over Venus so add that alarm and two Venus probes are properly positioned okay back to our mission around the earth currently attempting re-entry the net drain is not that bad I mean uh, it's enough electric charge to get us back home that's for sure so I don't think I need to upscale the solar panels or anything that looks vaguely Australia, doesn't it? Yes, we are over Australia. The parachute is going red. Now, see, I've had a problem with these parachutes suspiciously blowing up on me. Now, it should be pretty well shielded, I mean, considering how close it is to the heat shield. Better not be glowing red. I mean, the heat shield can blow up, that I understand, but... But it is pretty light heat shield loading. I mean, this is a uh, 1 meter heat shield and we're only 0.15 tons. But it's looking like this recovery system could work. And this is important for our sample return mission, of course. I, I think the lunar rated heat shields are heavier than these LEO ones. So we might want to just keep this system. Or will it randomly decide to blow up on me? I don't know. 
we did have a curious trajectory back, right? It wasn't a, the most straightforward thing. But this has survived. Wonder if analyze. We've got communication. Analyze telemetry? Yeah, we haven't done that yet. Okay, we have parachute pre deployment. Not the slowest speed that we get as a result, 9 meters per second. But that did leave the parachute fairly light, thankfully. And we like light parachutes. It's possible that the heat shield will explode on impact though. They're fairly delicate. But everything else is fine. <laughs> So, yep, yeah, uh, well, this worked. This worked fine. Even down to the heat shield exploding as, as expected. So, recover. So, granted, it wasn't the greatest achievement ever, but we did recover a vessel from orbit around the moon, and that is something we had not done before. And we learned something about the LEO heat shields. And I'll take it, given the failures earlier in the episode. So with that, I'll say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did enjoy this episode, please do, do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below. And I'll see you next time.